ladies and gentlemen, we will start our event on the, the role of nuclear energy in providing affordable, resilient, and uh, secure energy supply. And uh, we're very honored to have the uh, presence of Dr. Birol, Executive Director of the International Energy Agency, who will share his thoughts on uh, uh, the role of nuclear energy in the energy, clean energy transition. Um, so the floor is yours, uh, uh, DG and uh, Dr. Birol. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ari. Uh, thank you, everybody, uh, for, for being here. I uh, hope you can listen to us. Uh, in, the, in the middle of this um, noisy um, environment we have. But uh, this is a very special uh, moment for us here. Uh, you know, Fati, this is the first time that in the COPS you have an, a nuclear pavilion, which is also a sign of the times, as they say, in the sense that we are having a place where uh, all those who have a voice in uh, energy uh, in the world um, have a place to discuss this issue in the context of climate change. And of course, no one better than you who have the real uh, bird's eye view on everything that is going on in the world when it comes to, the, uh, to energy uh, to share uh, with us and those who are uh, connecting with us uh, all over the world um, your thoughts about the current situation the role of nuclear, and any other thoughts that you may have. Thank you very much, Fati, for being here with me today. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rafael. First of all, may I uh, thank you for, uh, after uh, being at the helm of the IAEA, uh, for your uh, very dynamic leadership both in terms of the nuclear power in uh, energy, but also beyond that. So very many thanks for your uh, leadership running around uh, the world and uh, trying to avoid uh, unnecessary and negative consequences of the current conflict uh, we are seeing in the world. So very many thanks, first of all, for that. Second, uh, I am very happy to see that the IEA, International Energy Agency, is not anymore alone to try to show the world that nuclear has its place when it comes to addressing energy security and uh, climate change challenges. Uh, there are many good indications there, and one of them is a very concrete one. Is for the first time, as you said, IAEA is uh, having a pavilion, have a strong presence at the COP meeting. Thank you very much uh, for it. Now, coming back to the nuclear power, uh, maybe, Rafael, you remember Paris last November. We were there together. There was a major, thousands of people, a World Nuclear Association meeting with uh, Bruno Le Maire, the French uh, finance minister, yourself and me, we had a discussion there in front of the audience. It was in November last year, and there I said, looking at the market trends, nuclear may well make a comeback after a big pause. Nuclear energy may well make a comeback. It was well before the invasion of uh, Ukraine by uh, Russia. Invasion is February this year, I said in November. Now today, when I look at the government responses around the world, the current crisis, energy crisis, and the climate change, I see that I have to revise what I said in November. Nuclear is making a comeback. Nuclear is making a comeback and in a strong uh, fashion. I see it in three phases. One, uh, the countries who wanted to say goodbye to nuclear power, they are rethink rethinking their plans. And the International Energy Agency has discussed with many of them, including Germany and Belgium, and we are very happy that the both governments are uh, 
now in the process of uh, postponing the nuclear phase-out plans, understanding the role of nuclear to address this energy security challenge. This is one group. Second group of uh, countries, they were reluctant, many countries with the nuclear industry, in terms of the uh, extension of the lifetime of the existing nuclear power plants, who were functioning perfectly, and they come to uh, 40 years old, 35 years old. Now I see that the many governments are extending the lifetime of existing nuclear power plants around the world from uh, North America to Europe, uh, from Europe uh, to uh, Asia. So this is very good because extending the lifetime of nuclear power plants is one of the cheapest source of clean electricity generation in the world. Third category is the countries have now uh, having a, about Netherlands, for example, Poland, uh, the uh, several uh, countries in uh, Asia, and also uh, in the other parts of the uh, developing world. And here I should say that the countries like uh, two important nuclear countries, Japan and Korea, also revising their uh, nuclear uh, uh, policies. Uh, I was recently in Tokyo, thank uh, Prime Minister Kishida for considering uh, to restart of the nuclear power plants of uh, Japan and the same in Korea, I think there's a new uh, thinking of uh, nuclear power plants. To put all of them together, I may say uh, that the current energy crisis we are in, plus the, uh, the uh, climate commitments are leading to nuclear is making a strong uh, comeback and it is our job, your job, my job, all of our job to make sure that the facts are on the table and nuclear power together with the solar together with uh, onshore, offshore, with hydropower, and so on, uh, we uh, provide uh, clean electricity in the next years uh, to come. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Fatih, for, for that uh, overview, which uh, indeed uh, confirms uh, what we are seeing um, in the world, in, ma in many countries. Uh, but still, um, from our perspective, and I'm frequently asked this, uh, so, um, I, I would like to benefit from your wisdom on this one as well. What would be, according to you, the challenges that we would need as uh, nuclear institutions, um, the IEA in the normative global uh, perspective, but also the industry, that we should be looking at in order for this apparently seemingly promising curve to be confirmed? First of all, if I can put three things on the table. First, uh, you know, uh, nuclear was already making a, a good, uh, following good trend before uh, Fukushima. So we have to make sure uh, that we don't have such uh, uh, unexpected uh, incidents, uh, uh, technical, natural, or political incidents that is going to cast a dark shadow on nuclear which has nothing to do with the economics of uh, uh, nuclear. So we have to avoid those, and again, many thanks uh, for your uh, support, uh, uh, Rafael. The second one is nuclear industry. To be honest with you, nuclear industry globally doesn't have a very good reputation in terms of delivering on time and on budget. I think in nuclear industry, since there is a lot of uh, now orders around the world coming and will be coming, uh, it is important that the nuclear industry uh, have a bit more uh, di uh, discipline in terms of to deliver on time and on budget. So this is the, uh, the, uh, the delays and the cost overruns are a major problem we have to be careful. And the third one is uh, innovation. So uh, when we look at the world, uh, Rafael, the biggest electricity demand goes come from the emerging countries. And uh, for the emerging countries to build large-scale uh, nuclear power plants may be a bit challenging for many reasons, including financial, putting the first uh, down payment there, having the big uh, nuclear industry and uh, 
and the uh, uh, and the uh, technology. So, SMRs, small modular reactors, in that respect, is a very important area, and I think innovation will be crucial uh, here. Uh, I hear personally high expectations from small modular reactors, and there is a, a, a very big chance that the many developing countries would make use of SMRs in to meet the growing electricity demand for, for energy security, first of all, but also uh, for addressing the environmental issues. So, the SMR uh, is the, uh, the imperative in terms of innovation, and I hope that we will see SMRs uh, right before or around 2030 uh, to be commercially up and running in the world. Uh, thank you for, for that, and I know you <laughs> are running for an, another event, but if you could have a, um, still <coughs> sorry, a couple of minutes of your time uh, on, on, on one issue which um, has been preoccupying me, uh, I'm, I'm working on that as well, uh, and I'm sure you have a, a, a deeper perspective. Uh, it has to do with the international uh, financing institutions and their attitudes and approaches to nuclear. Do you see, we know that uh, traditionally uh, there, there was a lot of reluctancy and even normative uh, prohibition uh, to, to finance nuclear projects, which sounds quite um, amazing. Uh, but it, it was the case, even nationally, for some countries. Uh, there is uh, a bit of an opening of these debates, but how realistic is this? Do, do you think that we will have a level playing field when it comes to financing, or is that still quite unfeasible as you see the market? This is an uh, excellent point, uh, Rafael. Uh, when I look at the international financial institutions, multi development banks, and what they do today to have the, especially the emerging and developing world in terms of clean energy financing, I don't give them a, a passing grade. I think they failed, basically. They were not uh, there to support the clean energy transition in the emerging countries. I am very disappointed that the many of them doesn't put this as one of the key items in their agenda. This is number one. Number two, uh, I see that now they are slowly but surely, if I may use the expression, making up, and uh, they try to uh, reprioritize clean energy transition in their landing skills, which is very good. But now, if they approach the technologies in a dogmatic way, this would be again a big problem in terms of uh, their uh, support uh, in an adequate way to the developing countries. In my view, there shouldn't be a discrimination of any a clean energy source. And I have been discussing this in uh, Brussels with my colleagues a uh, long time, and I think the situation looks a bit uh, better now uh, in, in Europe, but it should be internationally, I think, uh, together with the uh, solar, wind, efficiency policies, uh, hydropower, uh, and uh, others, uh, nuclear should be uh, also benefiting, given the right conditions and frameworks, of course, from the uh, international financial institutions uh, support. This is my view. We are not yet there, but uh, I, and me, and the International Energy Agency will uh, push at every occasion that the nuclear uh, has a role in the eyes of IFRs international financial institutions in terms of the uh, clean energy uh, processes. Uh, thank you, Fatih. I think uh, you have to move on. I wanted to thank you for, for sharing some time with us today. Uh, you may know that uh, IEA and IAEA, apart from having these nice conversations among uh, uh, um, executive heads, do important work together, are analysts, do important work. We join forces from our perspective from, from nuclear to your wider efforts 
on on energy um, uh, as such. So thank you for those efforts, uh, Fatih. Uh, you know that, that with Dr. Bio we share another passion, uh, which is football. So before you leave, I wanted to ask you who is going to win the World Cup, and you know what the answer should be. Now, uh, in fact, I, I forgot. First of all, I want to thank you very much for uh, Mauro Icardi. So uh, this is an Argentinian player and uh, an excellent uh, player. Two boys, and he is also a wife in Kaboka. So uh, I should tell you thank you very much, and I have a great sympathy for uh, Argentina, not because of uh, Mauro Icardi, but uh, because of uh, Rafael Gossi. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Fatih, uh, for for that. Um, so uh, th this this session, uh, which allows me to to play a journalist, is uh, it's very nice to ask others uh, difficult questions. Um, so I am enjoying this, and I continue. So uh, the next uh, part of it will be to share uh, with you some perspectives. So, Ari, uh, if you could lead us into the next uh, participants, and I can still uh, enjoy my asking questions to them. Okay, so thank, thank, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Director General Grossi. So, it's our pleasure to uh, invite to, to the stage the four panelists, Dr. Katie Huff, um, uh, Assistant Secretary for Nuclear Energy at DOE, uh, His Excellency, uh, Al Hamadi, uh, Managing Director and CEO of ENEC. Uh, we have Ingemar Enqvist, uh, CEO of uh, the World Association of uh, Nuclear Operators. And we have Mr. Bartowski, uh, um, Special Envoy for Climate and Energy Cooperation from, the, from Poland. Director General, the floor is yours again. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, um, the, the, this uh, group of people, of course, um, is, is uh, very interesting because they represent uh, different perspectives of, of an issue which um, is, of course, uh, topical. And at the center of everything we are trying to do here at the, at the uh, nuclear pavilion. Uh, I would like to start with you, Kate. Uh, we've been uh, participating together on a number of events uh, recently in your country, Pittsburgh, then Washington. So we can see there's a lot of action when it comes to the policies um, um, led by uh, uh, Secretary Granholm and yourself and your team. Um, so. For me, it would be, and I think I'm sure for everybody here at the, at the Nuclear Pavilion, it would be very interesting to get two perspectives from you. One has to do with the, the biggest nuclear market, which is the United States, and we would like to get from you your, your perspective, what are your plans, what are your priorities, and also globally. The United States um, is the epitome of the global player, so you have a place uh, to fill, um, in, in many places, and we see uh, the United States present in different parts of the world. So, if you could share with us your perspective uh, on, on that, on your American American hat, and then the American in the world hat, I would be very grateful. Thank you so much. And I really especially appreciate that when we've had the opportunity to see each other in so many locations over the last few months with uh, Pittsburgh and IAEA General Conference in Vienna, and then the Nuclear Power Ministerial last month in DC, and of course here, uh, really caps it off. Uh, and so I'm, I'm grateful for that. I think that with my American American hat on, it is indeed the case that we have the largest nuclear fleet in the world, um, and we hope to continue uh, to have leadership in nuclear power, peaceful nuclear power. And as we look at our climate change uh, mitigation and adaptation goals, uh, one of the most critical aggressive goals is to get to zero carbon electricity incredibly quickly uh, by 2035, get to net zero by 2050. We cannot do it without nuclear, and we must maintain, in the United States at least, the existing capacity that we already have, which is you know 92 reactors worth. It's you know nearly 94 gigawatts electric. Uh, 
but we, by 2050, likely will need to double that capacity. Uh, and what that means is that we need to build nuclear reactors over the course of the next few years at a much greater pace than we have built them in quite a long time. And so we're really excited to be turning on new AP1000s this coming year at Vogel, building advanced reactors, including small modular reactors like the New Scale reactor, the, uh, as well as advanced reactors like the Natrium Sodium Cooled Fast Reactor and the XE100 X Energy High Temperature Gas Reactor. Uh, these are all things happening you know, in the coming years and decade. And we're really excited about them because they should be the first of N of a kind uh, hopefully getting us to 200 gigawatts of nuclear power by 2050 at the, at the latest. Globally, of course, you know, in order to do this across the world, we need to work with countries to make sure that they have the resources and tools to determine their own path, the amount of nuclear that they need and the amount of uh, nuclear that they might want from the United States or in partnership with the United States. And we're really excited that there are a lot of countries interested in working with us, even just for exploration of their own interests, but also broadly enough to include export from us to them with our excellent nuclear technology. Um, but it does require export financing that I think will be a challenge, and you know we can get into that more deeply. And it, it's going to require incredibly, uh, you know, aggressive kind of engagement on all sides if we're going to get things built on time. So, you know, from my perspective, I really think it's our responsibility to build those first few units and give confidence in the international market about those designs themselves. You know, with the AP1000, you can go and tour them functioning in a few places and starting up in the United States. So I think that helps, and we should see that with SMRs soon. Thank you very much. Uh, Next, I would like to turn also to someone who has national and international now, international hats um, as, as well. But of course, uh, when it comes to, uh, to Mohammed al uh, and, the, and the Emirates, for whoever um, looks at, at nuclear, and you may have been asked this question a uh, thousand times, but let me tell you that it will continue because what you have, you've achieved in, in your country is so unique that many, uh, everybody around the world looks at it as a, an example of how a country takes a decision and follows a number of steps from zero to, uh, uh, to 100 and, and by doing it right. So uh, maybe um, in the context of uh, what we are seeing now here in Sharm el Sheikh, there is a lot of uh, concern we must feel, and we can see it, about the world being able and countries being able to take the right decisions. So why don't you walk us through again the, the path that was followed by your country uh, from looking at nuclear as something that could be into what it is now? Thank you, uh, DJ Rossi. If I may, first of all, comment on the, the situation we are in right now. So, uh, thanks you for the, thank you for your leadership on uh, since Glasgow COP26. Things have turned around. Uh, we could see there's more interest in nuclear, and as my colleague mentioned, uh, Professor Huff, that there's a doubling on, on nuclear by 2050. So that's great. And also look at the discussion here at the COP27. In, in Sharm el Sheikh and discussing nuclear, and also we welcome you to COP28 in, in Dubai. On the UAE program, the specific ingredient of success, I would say, was the clear determination from the nation's leadership to develop uh, a portfolio of energies, agnostic of technologies, that is clean, reliable, and resilient, and that will secure the nation's energy mix for decades to come. And nuclear did check all those marks. It's clean, it's reliable, and it provides energy security for the nation. And that's something where we've taken, we've taken from the early days of through our cooperation with the IEA and also through co cooperation with the US and other nations to develop our program. So the development went through multiple phases, 
with a clear determination to make this as meets the highest standards of safety, security, and operation. And we managed to do it, in a, in a, as you mentioned, in a record time. Uh, and this is something which is we are very proud of. And also, as of today, we have three units operational. One more unit will become operational soon. And that will provide 25% of the electricity for the UAE. And also avoiding emitting around 22 million tons of CO2 emissions annually. And that's a great achievement for uh, our nation. Indeed, in, indeed it is. Uh, we'll get back to you uh, in a second. Um, to, to my right, um, Ingemar Engvist, uh, an old friend uh, in, in nuclear in, in, in many respects and in many, in many incarnations. But now, your responsibility as CEO of uh, One of the World Association of Nuclear Operators. The title itself evokes a sense of community uh, and an idea of working together uh, to solve uh, problems. So in your mind as, as one head, what are those problems today? For those who are already nuclear, for those who want to be in nuclear, is it safety, is it security, is it uh, financing, is it technology? How is the community of operators looking at this these days? Thank you, Rafael. Yes. Um, I'll start in another end of the question. Uh, Wano, as an organization, uh, hasn't been very public over the last years, even since it first started 30 years ago. You should be aware of that all commercial operators are members of Wano. That means we have about 430 reactors as members of WANO. We have collected experience over 30 years, operational experience. So WANO's only purpose is to maximize safety and uh, operational excellence. And doing that, I think, is builds the foundation for uh, the new fu uh, future of, of nuclear. And that will address the, the energy trilemma of uh, security of supply, affordability, and a low carbon footprint. Because it's only when we are able to operate the current plants safely and reliably, we will maintain the public trust and improve the public trust for our technology. So in that sense, what WANA does is bringing all members together, sharing everything openly between us. You can imagine, is there any other industry where competitors come together to share experiences, events, best practices even? And this brings, brings a strength to this industry, and that's what we do in WANA. We are, as you said, a community of operators. And uh, we see that we have a, 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 a big purpose also for building the future of this technology. Uh, and we also, I'll come back to that later maybe, we also provide assistance to new units and new entrants. Thank you, Ingemar, uh, for that. Let me turn to Sebastian Barkowski. Um, it's my pleasure to meet with you on stage. Uh, we never met before. But of course, uh, we've been working and we work with Poland a lot uh, for, for, for many decades uh, at, the, at the IAEA. And Poland is a country which is, one cannot say it's new to nuclear. You have uh, technological capabilities, you have research reactors, you have a number of uh, qualities. Uh, but such an important nation in Europe was so far not including nuclear uh, in its um, energy mix. Actually, an exception in Eastern Europe, being one of the most important nations in Europe and in Eastern Europe. What changed in Poland? What were the drivers? Are the drivers those related to what we are discussing here in Sharm el-Sheikh uh, climate? Or are the drivers uh, different? 
So your perspective as special envoy, I understand, for energy and climate, if that is your position, um, uh, would be very interesting to, to know. Floor is yours. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Uh, let me start maybe with a very personal comment. I was for quite a few years in Brussels bubble. And we've been having as the, the ambassadors kind of the friends of nuclear round tables quite regularly. And what I've been witnessing is not just the shrinkage of our group. Each quarter or half a year we've been meeting one country out of the, the group. When I started there it was like 10 of us, when I ended after five years uh, five or six appearing. And I'm more than happy that with such events like here and with what Fatih Biro said, with the uh, nuclear back on track, we will have more and more of those, even in the very Brussels bubble, more and more of those influences. And I'm very happy that we as Poland have joined not only mentally, but as well in deeds. Just very recently, the club of, uh, of uh, nuclear. You, you asked about the, the driver story. Definitely, it's our climate transformation. Because in Poland, when you talk climate transformation, you mean the energy transformation. For us, this circle you see there, it's not 37% red, it's 75% red. And to find the replacement for coal, we need to think renewables. We were thinking natural gas as a transition. And we've been constant in putting as well the nuclear somewhere there on our tracks. But then came this year the unprecedented, unprovoked aggression of Russia on Ukraine. This made us not only speed up our nuclear program, but it made as well us to think that the nuclear has to find a place in the very demanding and long-term process as the energy transition, climate transition will be for Poland that we have to pursue for the years to come, being secure and safe in terms of energy, of climate, and committed to transform our, uh, our economy and our energy. But the war of aggression made us as well go a step further than what we even thought about. Because two weeks ago, we have not only announced our first official decision to have a state-funded nuclear power plant launched with the help of our American friends from Western House, but we have as well decided that, or not we, our private energy companies have decided that in parallel they will be very strongly thinking about the another nuclear power plant that was never ever been thought about as a private partnership between Polish companies and the Korean companies. So we are back on track of nuclear, what we gave up in the 80s at the end of the communist era. We are back on track, hopefully twice as fast as we ever thought a year ago, two years ago. And hopefully we will have constant help of international organizations, of the business people, of other countries that are already well advanced, that are, as Fatih Biro said, back on track with, with Nuclear. We will manage to, to achieve the, the goal of the transition for Poland, for the EU, and for the whole international society. Thank you very much. That was, that was an interesting perspective and indeed it's a case that we are all following and we will be the IA supporting you as you know. We are already working with our Polish uh, counterparts because the effort is going to be big. But the IEA, of course, will be there uh, to, to, to support them. Okay, if I can get back to you. Um, 
Uh, now, with a, if you allow me, with a, a bit more specific question than than the big, you know, big picture um, uh, issues like approaches from the United States. Uh, the work that your department and we can see through the labs and other places in the United States that is being carried out on fuel is one of the most um, fascinating and interesting and promising, I would, I would even say, that we, we are seeing. Um, I would be interested in, in your perspectives uh, on that. Sure. So, you know, I think... Um in the United States, we have the benefit of having had decades of work in our national laboratories to identify advanced fuel types that could be used in new reactors. This includes everything from advanced cladding for our existing reactors, triso, tristructural isotropic fuels um, for high temperature gas reactors, metal fuels for our sodium cooled fast reactors, molten salt fuels for potential molten salt reactors in the future decades. Uh, many of those fuels do require high assay, low enriched uranium, so it is an important component of what our focus is on right now in our government. Um, that low enriched uranium is enriched all the way up to close to 20% in the 19.75 range, and it requires slightly adjusted facilities and licenses. It includes some you know, extra research and quite a bit more enrichment capacity. And this kind of brings to mind a particular focus in the United States right now um, on the security of our fuel supply, which is challenged. Um, as we noted before, we have the largest fleet in the world. That fleet, uh, the current commercial fleet, relies on low enriched uranium at around 5% and 20% of that conversion and enrichment capacity is uh, in, from Russia right now in our country. And so this has spurred an interest from us in identifying ways to secure and improve the capacity for our fuel supply, not just for that 5% enriched uranium, but also that 20% high assay low enriched uranium, which has the unique challenge of having only one commercial scale supplier in the world, which is in Russia, and recognizing Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the relationship in which Russia has weaponized energy supply chains across the board, uh, we in the United States are taking this as an opportunity to invest in our fuel supply chain. And uh, we really hope that in the coming years, we will see an expansion, not just in the United States, but with our allies and partners around the world that can be trusted to be part of that fuel supply chain. We are investing in improved enrichment and conversion capacity, particularly right now. We have from the Inflation Reduction Act $700 million allocated to my office to improve the fuel supply chain for high assay low enriched uranium required for these advanced reactors, relying on these advanced fuel technologies, uh, and that will be used to spur real ex expansion of our enrichment capability. We also broadly have a uranium strategy that we hope to have funded through work with our Congress that should also help to ro improve the robustness of our global low enriched uranium supply with ourselves and our partners and allies. So, you know, this really comes back to energy security, to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, but also to the technology that we've been able to develop in support of these advanced reactors. Well, indeed, it is, it is something that uh, is not so frequently discussed uh, in, in public fora like this, but as you can see from what you said, uh, uh, is key for the development and the future of the sector. In the United States, uh, Anna Brown, I'm talking about the future. Uh, Mohamed, if I can turn back to you uh, again. Uh, yeah, you have a, yes. Um, do you, I mean, you, we see that the cycle of Baraka uh, in terms of coming to fruition is almost complete. So how does the f nuclear future for uh, the Emirates look like, consolidation of that, looking into new areas, development of human capacities, looking at modu modularity, what, what's in your mind? Thank you, Mr. Gross, for that question. If I may just take one uh, point at strategic level, then I will answer your question. So globally today, if you look at the 
energy consumption or countries who consume a high density of energy per capita. The number of GDP around two thousand dollars, where people start consuming more more energy, and it peaks until around twenty thousand dollars per GDP, where the number it grows ten times. And if I can use an example, South Korea is a good example of that. When the GDP went from two thousand dollars to twenty thousand dollars, the energy consumption per capita went ten times more. And if we talk about the countries who are between the 2,000 and 20,000, the population of the world is around 700 million. So we have another 4 billion waiting in the, in the pipeline to go and their GDP to grow and the energy consumption to grow more and more and more. So that, looking at that globally, we have 4 billion who will need more energy that we need to think about. So if I can take that to UAE perspective, we've created a resilient energy source, sources with uh, fossil fuel, renewable energy, and nuclear. And to your specific questions, Mr. Grossi, on the nuclear, we focused a lot of effort on human capital development to develop people who will operate and maintain those reactors for the next six years plus. And we've been doing this in full collaboration with the IEA, with nations like US and others, and WANO. And that's helping us to develop a counter of key people who will operate in one of those power plants for decades to come. Now, after finishing the four units, what's the ambition? And that's a great question. I would say the sky is the limit. For us to be involved in the civilian nuclear industry, and I would say also a reliable partner when it comes to energy sources, UAE is doing a great at that front. And we do invest seriously and heavily to be able to be part of that net zero targets with investing and working in collaboration with other nations on SMR, advanced reactors, hydrogen, and these are targets that we are putting in our 2050 net zero. So as I said, the sky's the limit. We look forward for cooperation, collaboration with the nations and with the IEA. And uh, working jointly, collaborating together, we can, we can do a lot. We're also looking at investment opportunities in Europe and other countries in the conventional reactors, also in advanced reactors. So uh, we have the capabilities. We have, we, we've done it in the country, delivering it to high standards on budget and on time. And uh, we're looking for the world to, uh, to share our experience and knowledge in the short term and collaborate with the advancement reactors in the medium to longer term. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, very, very inspiring indeed. And uh, to see that that ambition is not um, uh, virtually out, it's continuing. Imar, um, one of, in a certain sense, one of, um, came together as a result of, um, of a traumatic experience. Uh, but that allowed uh, the, the industry, like you were saying, uh, to work cooperatively, setting aside competition, looking at what unites you. Um, do you see um, areas where one or is going to be focusing more in the future? Is it going to be safety, security? Is it going to be helping operators venture into modularity? Um, are you uh, thinking strategically in these terms or do you concentrate on doing what you do, doing it in a more rigorous and meticulous way and continuing in the, on this path? Well, it's clear that we are in, a, in, in facing a new era of nuclear where we will have new technologies coming up. SMRs has been, you know, it's a hot topic everywhere. There will be other technologies probably coming online as well. And we must realize that specifically for SMRs, the operators might not be conventional utilities anymore. It could be the mining industry in remote areas where there is no national grid connection. Could be a battery factory somewhere. 
and operating the nuclear plant is not the core business. So, we stand ready to, uh, to welcome every operator of whatever technology they are operating to become members of WANO. As from the moment you join as a member, you get access to all the information we have collected over the years. We also have specific programs in place to support new units and new entrants. First, I would say, due to the great efforts of IEA, preparing a nation to embark on a nuclear journey. Once there is a project in place, we encourage these uh, projects to join one of And I think that's the experience from the Emirates, which was very early to join one of I think has benefited from the membership and the support, and we are ready to support anyone who is thinking about the nuclear project. And we have one important publication in place, which is called Roadmap to Operational Readiness. And that, that document describes the whole journey from preparing a project until commercial operation. And we have gathered the experiences very much from UAE, but from other projects. And this is a living document where we collect all the recent experiences to help these projects to, to, to transfer from a project state to an operational phase. Because that's one of the bigger challenges. Um, conducting a nuclear project with project management is one thing, but to operate is a plant safely and reliably is completely another challenge. And we are there to bridge this phase from the first phase to the second phase. And uh, again, I can only encourage all those who are thinking about embarking on, on, on a nuclear project, think about the benefits of being a member of the, the world community of nuclear operators, and that is one of them. Indeed, indeed, that is, that is very true. Um, Mr. Markovsky, uh, the these important announcements that you were referring to, and everybody, of course, from the IEA, we were following that with great interest, that were made, uh, seem to point to a program, very ambitious program, of um, uh, large nuclear reactors. Is Poland th also thinking about modularity? Um, we see, for example, that in general in the world, uh, there is a lot of talk about um, uh, having uh, SMRs coupled with a balance of plant of old coal uh, plants. That is the model that is in, in development in the United States, for example, which, mean, which seems to be very promising. Is that part of your ideas? Uh, thanks. This is indeed a very, very good question. And you know, we were not that bold to announce the three parts to the we have two parts to follow now what I, what I just, uh, just told you, the, the, the state part and the private companies part. And to be very, very frank, we've been looking at the SMRs for the past years, as we all did, in fact, as we've been trying. Okay, looming on the horizon, but not there yet. But we hope, once again, as, as you've been discussing with, with uh, Fatih just at the very beginning, the push towards nuclear nowadays may mean that we will have a huge leap in development. And we may see the SMRs really with us closer than further. And that, that's why when we've been revamping our, our program recently, we have as well been once again returned to the positive thinking about the small modules. Definitely what you have, what you have just said, put them closer to where the real needs are, this would be of utmost importance. Say, for example, from the point of view of, of the uh, electrical grid. We, instead of constant investments in the grid, what we have, I think, a little bit overslept in Europe at least, if we make this leap forward and we'll have, for example, a small module in a huge fertilizers facility producing plant in Poland, then we will be twice as lucky as we are, as we are now. 
So definitely, we are back with the positive thinking about, about modules. This is something our companies are coming with the ideas from the government saying, jump on, jump on the closer as well. So we, we put our warm calls on the issues of this. Thank you very much. That was very clear. Well, we are coming to the close of this of this panel, but I would still uh, like to offer um, each one of you uh, a, a minute for a final thought, something you would have liked me to ask you, something you would have you would like to say at this first panel at the first ever um, nuclear pavilion uh, at the COP. Katie, you first. Sure. Well, first, thank you for having me. It's been a fun conversation, very interesting to hear from some of you. I think the thing that I think about a lot is precisely this kind of fit for purpose deployment of reactors, maybe at a coal plant, maybe for desalination, maybe for the production of hydrogen, perhaps at point near the location where you might make hydrogen, turn it into ammonia, turn it into fertilizer, then use it in a field. You know, I really see a huge amount of decarbonization in the non-electric sector from nuclear because it produces thermal energy as its primary energy, right? And there are very few scalable sources of clean, hot heat, right? And advanced reactors can get up to this 800 degrees Celsius or similar. The just ordinary light water reactors have incredibly useful steam. In the United States, we have a very small amount of district heating but that small amount of district heating is all fossils. And I think we really look out at the international world and we see a lot more opportunity for nuclear power to produce that very valuable thermal heat as a primary source. And never forget, a, a gigawatt electric reactor is actually three gigawatts thermal, right? And that conversion, when we take that incredibly valuable heat and turn it into electricity, isn't even the most efficient way we could be using nuclear. And I really hope that we can all recognize the role that that can play to help renewables along in an, in an area that will be very hard for renewables alone to decarbonize. So I think about that a lot. A absolutely, that's very interesting. Dr. Alamari, please, your final thoughts. First of all, for us in the UAE, we are enjoying the benefit of nuclear recently, and we've been operating our reactors for the last uh, few years. And it's a great for us to be able to reduce our carbon footprint and enjoy this uh, technology that will provide 25% electricity for the UAE. That said, now the challenge ahead of all of us in this panel and people who are also listening the target by 2050 is to double the current capacity of nuclear technology. So we need to think about supply chain, human capital development, investment in those opportunities. But I would encourage everybody in the UAE, we made a bold decision to make it happen. I would encourage everybody to work in a collaborative manner to make this happen under the leadership and guidance of the IEA and internationally collaborating together. Thank you for that. Igor, a final thought? Yeah, I would like to focus more on the human aspect of this industry, if I may. Uh, I've been involved in the industry for 30 years, uh, worked mostly in Sweden for many, many years, the, the last 10 years maybe internationally, and I've understood, first of all, this industry has so many fantastic people working, and it's such a friendly atmosphere. Wherever you go in the world, you're welcome as a nuclear professional. We speak sort of a common language, which is unique. Secondly, this industry offers so many opportunities for the next generation. And I believe we need also to focus on fostering the next generation leaders in this industry. Because middle-aged men like me, we are retiring and need to be replaced soon. So I'm encouraging that we also attract talents to the industry in a diverse manner. Age diversity, gender diversity, cultural diversity, in all aspects of diversity. Because we need all the talent we can get. And we need a welcoming you know, attitude to all new 
young talents to join this industry because we need, I'm looking out some young people, we need you desperately for the future. That, that's very appropriate. And of course, um, Sebastian, for your last uh, thoughts um, about uh, what we discussed today, the plans, uh, all these enthusiasm coming from Poland. Yes, yes, thanks. I think I will, I will just start when you both guys ended. Human factor and the enthusiasm needed. Because for, for each and every endeavor you need will, you need resources, and you need capabilities. Resources, capabilities, you cover. But the will, the will of the society in this case. And this is extremely important. In the case of country I know best, in the case of Poland, we are extremely lucky that notwithstanding the Chernobyl disaster, notwithstanding the Fukushima, and notwithstanding the recent shelling of the Ukrainian infrastructure, the support for nuclear in Poland is constant at 70 plus percent. But we need to keep all our societies in Poland, in the European Union, worldwide, really enthusiastic about, about nuclear. Because we like to think in Poland about the uh, climate transformation in terms of just transition. And the just transition is in the first place for the, for the citizens. It's not the endeavor for the business, it's not the endeavor for the politicians, it's for the society, it's for the future. So with the enthusiasm, with the human factor and the broad terms, we will be lucky to have the nuclear with us as a net zero source for energy for the state of future. Well, thank you very much. I, I, I don't know you, but uh, I uh, enjoyed, really enjoyed this this conversation and when you think about it the the uh, the biggest uh, uh, nuclear nation the once newcomer but no longer and well established an old and wise nation taking the plunge the uh, leader of the operators all together here uh, at this nuclear pavilion i think it is the best the best example of what this community uh, can do for this lofty goal of having a decarbonized economy. Thank you very much. I hope you continue enjoying uh, events here uh, and elsewhere. It was great to see you and thank you all. Give it for them, please.